Well, hello there, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. This is Watches Tonight. Tonight on Watches Tonight, we are discussing the best watches you can buy for $20,000 in cash. And we're talking about mistakes people make when they impulse buy, specifically all of that plus your viewer wrist shots tonight on Watches Tonight. Calling out Edward Ledden of Sweden, first man in the box, Joe Pinto from Scarsdale, New York, instead of Louisville, Kentucky. This time, Alex O, Kenneth S. Kenneth, you're fourth, but I still appreciate the effort. Joe Tyson from Apex, North Carolina. Dan CT, Enrique C. Wachusiest, staying up late in Dubai with Watchbox Dubai, I hope. Scott Wexlin, Hale Bop, Marcus T of Germany, Dylan L. Dylan, I appreciate that shot you sent in late. Wolfgang, I'm sure, will also appreciate it. I understand you're going to smoke a cigar when the workday is done. Wolfgang would understand and approve. We've got Rich Gotti, Richard Tutu, Jim M, Adrian V, Ran from Louisville, Watches and Whiskey from Baltimore. Actually, I think Watches and Whiskey is from Philly. We've got another whiskey guy from Baltimore. We've got Arto Charles in Manhattan, New York, and J. Bo Surf from Adelaide, Australia. We've also got Yasis J. Remember guys, check out thewatchbox.com. They're the people who pay me, they make this show possible. They're effectively the obligatory executive producer on everything I do, which means check out thewatchbox.com. It's sort of like my way upscale Patreon page. Any brand you like, any style, we've got 3,000 watches live right now. Of course, Sean is operating the switcher tonight. He is making the magic happen off screen. Okay, so while we file into the show, I see Simon Templar, C. Flynn, Mark S. from Brooklyn, MCC, Sean Hansen. While we file in, I've come to realize that watch collectors brutalize the language of their hobby like none other. I mean, equestrians, sailors, and scotch fans are generally sticklers for pronunciation and terminology. But I've seen people spend incredible amounts of money on watches while bragging about their Torbillions, Quantiums, and Audemars Piggy. It's happened. Of course, as a dealer, I can use this ignorance to my advantage. Ultimately, once you have a $60,000 Audemars Piggy, you really need to complete the set with a Kermit. But up. All right. And it's true. Bad watch pronunciation. Everything from Cartier to Audemars Piguet to you don't even want to hear how they pronounce chronometry for Nan Bertou. It's awful. And it gets worse and worse the more obscure the brand is. Rolex got it right out of the gate in 1905, a name that almost nobody can mispronounce. The confusion there is the plural of Rolex. Rolexes, Rolexi, Rolexor, Rolex watches? We don't really know. Now, jumping into the box one more time, we've got Gil Mibson, Eric Nielsen, and Matteo C. joining in along with Burping and Neil from the UK. Welcome, guys. Welcome, Envy Scotsman, and welcome, Martin H. from Denmark. Okay, so viewer wrist shots number one, I asked you answered. We have some great pieces on tonight, starting with Kunal M. And his Patek Philippe Calatrava 5196 landing through the blinding wildfire debris at the Reno airport. That's what that red glow is. It's the California, or I should say, Western State wildfires. And we've got Andre A, who is joining us from Penn State University, where he works, with his watch box bought 50 Fathoms, tribute to Millspec. Thank you for trusting our company, Andres. We have Watchusiest and his Moser Mosaic preparing to watch watches tonight. Damien W and his JLC Master Ultra Thin Perpetual Calendar are at Lac de Joux in Switzerland, overlooking the traditional watchmaking valley in French Switzerland with the rose gold version of the Doctor Strange. We've got Coleman of Sydney showcasing his 2021 Patek Calatrava 6119 with the internet's favorite doge breed, the Shiba Inu. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your analog on my digital. Digital. Okay, question here from Envy Scotsman. Tim, thoughts on Speedmaster versus Chronomaster Sport? So we're comparing, I assume, a Moonwatch here versus the 2021 Zenith Chronomaster Sport. Well, here's the thing. The Moonwatch is not trying to be something it's not. The Moonwatch is a much more affordable watch. You're talking eh, about a 
3500 to $4,000 price difference, depending on whether we're talking straps or bracelets. So the Omega is going to be a lot more affordable. Now, you may like the spectacular striking 10th complication of the Chronomaster. You might prefer its 100 meter water resistance. You might like the option of having a white or a black dial. All of this is legitimate, and of course, an automatic movement brings its own conveniences, plus an extra 10 hours of power reserve. But if you want a watch that's truly an original, I would go with the newly upgraded Moon Watch. I would say you could almost say that the price difference between the Chronomaster Sport and the standard Moon Watch is very similar to the price difference between the Chronomaster Sport and the Ed White. And once you start talking about that type of hardware, if we can step up as well as down. I think it's tough not to say Omega, but I would say for $10,000, negotiate a bit because they're no longer waitlisted. The Chronomaster Sport's probably the watch I would prefer to wear day in and day out. Even if it is highly derivative, it's an impressive and attractive and versatile machine. Okay, speaking of which, impulse buys that watch collectors make. Now, different kind of watch collectors have different approaches to buying their watches. My philosophy of watch collecting was always highly regimented. I wanted to have a picture of everything JLC did well, historically, complications, important milestone models, and milestone model lines. So I pretty much knew what I was going to be buying years in advance, and I checked the boxes. Now, whether that was or wasn't the right approach, the fact is there are other approaches, and many people are very emotional with their purchases, and they fall into the category of impulse buyers. So tonight, I'm I'm going to break down the right way and the wrong way to buy on impulse. First, I want to say that emotionally purchasing watches is natural and there's nothing inherently wrong with it. It's a great way to act out your heart's desire as long as the money is in order and you know your other options. I always say never act in ignorance. So don't impulse buy a watch if you don't know what the other options are. If you already have a good sense of the alternatives to a moon watch and the moon watch still captures your heart, buy the moon watch. But don't make these mistakes. Don't buy under the influence. And by that, I'm not talking about drugs. I'm talking about social media, chat rooms, pop culture, peer pressure, dealer sales pressure. All of that can lead you to make the wrong impulse purchase, which is why I always try to give information on my social media and not specifically say, if you're going to buy just one, make it this. I rarely say that. I generally leave it up to you to decide which of the thousands of watches I review is right for you. So I would all say, also say that all these things put your shoe in the direction of someone else's opinion. It might be a good match for yours just by accident, but most of the time, someone else, since this is an emotional and particular hobby, someone else is going to have a very different dream watch than you have. And in the moment, when you're about to spend thousands or tens of thousands of dollars, you really deserve the satisfaction of getting what you want most. So, mainstream views tend to focus on mainstream models and brands. Go on. Check out how many tags there are for Rolex on Instagram. There are more tags for Rolex than for Swiss watch and Swiss watches. Think about that for a second. It means there's an awful lot of inertia and current pushing you towards a Rolex purchase. And that's before we get to Audemars Piguet and F.P. Journ and Patek Philippe. It's important to look outside of the mainstream. You're going to find that a lot of people who are very low-key on low-key forums are going to provide better information and more honest accounts than people who are simply striving to get the most clicks. That's right. Not every influencer is interested in selling something specific. Specifically, they might just be interested in clickbaiting their way to a million followers. So don't necessarily take buying advice from that kind of medium. I would also say if you follow mainstream social media and pop culture, you're going to find that it's not a great match for your tastes if what you might like more is Gerard Perregaux, Ulysse Norden, Glasuta Original, Parmigiani Fleurier, and Beauvais. Those are brands that you're only going to encounter if you're patient. You spend some time in places like Watch Pro Site on the internet or some of the secondary and tertiary forums on Watch You Seek, where you might encounter the people who are actually into these watches. So, in other words, know the watch community and the watch social media ecosystem well enough to avoid the mainstream and take in some of those other streams, the other 
other currents where you might find things you adore that you never considered in the first place. Now, I would also say, ask if you want to buy watches under the influence of drugs. <laughs> this, is why I, this is why I say never do it, because the outcomes can be horrific. But if you do truly buy under the influence of drugs and not just influencers, it leads to this. And now you're $200,000 short and the owner of a Pokemon Tour Billion. And folks, <laughs> that's not a pretty place to be. That has always been my singular example that I hold up for everything that's wrong with pop culture worship in the Swiss watch industry. It remains a piece unique, and thank God for that. All right, jumping into the box right here. Let's see what you guys are saying. Oh, this chat box moves fast. We have one comment saying, French is tough. Scott Wexlin asking, is Loki a watch guy? I haven't seen the Loki series on Disney Plus, so I don't know, but I'll have to get caught up on that eventually. We've got Nolan Reed joining in from the American state of Alabama, and we've got Gail Mibson saying Japan, aka Seiko, should do their own COSC. You know, I would not be shocked if they're actually adjusting the watches to the ISO 3159, because many of the Grand Seiko high beat watches come with an assurance that they'll keep no worse time than minus three plus five seconds per 24 hours. That's in excess of the COSC. But there is an international chronometer standard called the ISO 3159, and that is the basis for the COSC. In order to call a watch chronomet in Switzerland, you generally have to go through the COSC. Sure, FP Journe flouts it, some do, but in general, it's a COSC certification. The standard the COSC uses is not a COSC standard. It's pulled from a standard by the ISO that I believe Grand Seiko does use for the high beat movements. What else is going on here? Alex O, High Horology Chronograph, Arnold & Son CTB or JLC Dual Met. You can get a CTB for outrageous money, like 15 grand or less, and it's a retail price of 27,000, so that's a fantastic bargain. But remember, those white gold JLC Dual Met chronographs originally sold for about $55,000. If you can pick those up in the high 20s, low 30s, you're getting a much more substantial high horology watch. And as much as I love the CTB, I put my money down and I bought the Duomet and I owned it for four years and I loved it. It was the most accurate mechanical watch I ever possessed. And I can tell you that the CTB being 44 and the Duomet being 42, they do wear differently and the Duomet wears better. Also, if you can get over the chronograph, there are 40.5 millimeter Duomet models, including the sublime a Cantiema Lunaire with the enamel dial in white gold. That is a very special watch and definitely worth your consideration. Simon T is saying, it's in Lapland, Northern Finland. I'm not sure what the preceding question was. Let's see what else is going on. We've got a Mick in Florida joining in from the Florida Keys. Thomas Burnett, Jack Dodson from Draper, Utah. We've got Luis Molina saying, if you could have only two submarines, which ones would they be? I would take SSN 571, uh, the USS Nautilus, and because it's equipped for covert ops and a Sea Wolf, the Jimmy Carter. Those would be my favorite submarines. And maybe the NR1 if it still existed, because a nuclear mini sub is just awesome. What else is going on? We have a friend who's saying evening from, uh, there it is. We got fries with mayo, evening from across the pond. Thank you for staying up late. Mark S is saying typhoon class. The typhoon class sub, which includes the world's most horrific looking swimming pool. Look it up, open a different window, keep me streaming, right? Typhoon class sub swimming pool. It looks like a prison pool from hell. All right, let's jump back into our regularly scheduled program. Never buy a watch on impulse on credit. I say never finance fun. It's even worse when you're doing it with a credit card. Here's the thing, borrowing money to buy watches is a sign that your impulses have gone too far and they've taken over the process. Loans, credit, hock, whatever, all of it's bad. So it's stress that takes the fun out of the ownership experience. Your watch should be all yours from the moment you put it on your wrist. A watch is a very intimate thing. You don't want it to be half owned or majority owned by a credit card company or a bank or your mom. I would also say buy impulsively if that's your way, but take your wrist with style selection, not finances. Now here's the thing. 
I can understand if you've got the cash to pay it off immediately and you're just doing it for flyer miles or cash back or to upgrade your card, all of that is cool. That's not really the same thing as borrowing money to buy the watch because you've already got the cash to pay it off and you're doing it as a stratagem to take advantage of some sort of card benefit. That's completely different. And of course, there is that badass American Express, as we all know, for the millionaires of the world that you will use to buy your DB28 Tourbillon. And if you do that with an American Express black card Centurion, then you are an absolute badass. Richard Mille, Debatoon, Grubel Forcey, all bought on the black card, all awesome, all fantastic theater to impress your friends when you're out on a watch tourism spree in Miami, LA, Geneva, or New York. But remember, the guy who can buy a watch on that card can pay for the watch in cash. Otherwise, he wouldn't have that card. Let's see what else is going on in the box. We got Rick Goffman saying, use a credit card for the transaction and then pay it off. I agree, pay the full balance. But if you can't pay the full balance, don't get in over your head. Don't even start down that path. Naresh Pape saying, I love the Pokemon Wash, not going to lie. Yes, but there's a $20,000 version that has the same dial without the Torbion. Do you still want the $200,000 version, Naresh? Okay, also, don't impulse buy a watch naked. No, 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 not you, the watch. The watch. It's very easy to get in over your head. Usually when you're out of the country or you're out of state or you're on a vacation, I've found that a shocking percentage of watches bought on watch tourism buying sprees, usually in places like New York or the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, duty-free shops and airports, people don't follow up and take delivery of the boxed set. For whatever reason, they're in a panic to try to get through customs without people looking too closely at their purchases. Uh, they just don't follow up with the dealer to send the box, or they don't follow up with the owner to send the box. And again, a lot of times this is strictly because they don't want to be caught with a pile of boxes and papers going through customs with a watch they didn't declare. So, remember, if you're going to do this, Watch tourism is always about paying too much, always, 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 for instant gratification. But if you're going to impulse buy, make sure you get the box with the watch. Maybe not with you on your trip home, but sent via airmail quickly, completely, and intact. Because too many watches are bought and then left naked when the vacation buyer never follows up for the rest of the kit. And especially with something like a Patek that you buy in the US islands, you are gonna wind up with an unsellable watch if you don't have that certificate of origin. Remember that, buy the watch, not the deal, especially if you see something online and you're not on a watch tourism vacation and it just seems too good to be true and you just click buy. You click buy on Chrono24, you work something out, and then you have buyer's remorse because you bought an exotic watch without the box and papers. It can be so easy in the moment to argue you're getting an incredible watch for the money. But remember, at the end of the day, if you're that guy who always wants the full set or you plan on reselling the watch, don't buy on impulse if the deal is too good to be true and the watch is naked. And finally, this is a big one at authorized dealers specifically. Don't impulse buy a watch to gain access to another watch. This is a really huge deal, and I mean really, really huge, because a lot of brands are doing this now, saying you have to buy some rose or yellow gold dress watch or ladies watch that nobody wants in order to get access to a watch that you do want. And everyone knows that that watch is probably gonna be some sort of full bracelet stainless steel sports watch. It's increasingly common. If you go into a Lanka dealer where they have this Potemkin application process where everyone gets approved for everything but the Odysseus. It's absurd that they're going to ask you to apply to buy a yellow gold Longa 1 or Grand Longa 1 so you can be considered for the wait list, the short wait list, to get this watch. That's absurd. If you basically have to bribe the dealer to let you get on a wait list or buy another watch, curtail your impulse and take your money elsewhere. Because to me, that's just borderline hostage crisis. That's the watch you're gonna wanna buy instead of the Odysseus. And for around 20 grand with a spectacular movement by Emmanuel Boucher, water resistance, a gorgeous dial, and a fun company with an accessible CEO, you're gonna wanna buy the Chapek Antarctique in one of its forms. That would be the optimal alternative to buying some sort of ladies watch like a little longer that you don't really want, a longer one in yellow gold and then getting the opportunity to buy the Odysseus. Circumvent the whole process and buy that. Okay, 
jumping in right here. Let's see what's going on. We have Simon T saying, I went into a Longa dealer and walked out with a Moser. The drugs were really good. That's an interesting experience. Jeff saying, and the black card is a charge card, so at the end of the month, it has to be paid off. Well, there you go. But the guy who has the black card doesn't have a problem. No one really knows what it takes to get a black card. It's shrouded in myth, and American Express keeps it that way. Uh, but I've spoken to people who've like worked in golf pro shops or watch boutiques and car dealerships who have incredible stories to tell about the American Express black card. Let's see what else is going on here. We've got Mark S. saying, At Pete's Timepiece Safari, JLC is the better watch. The 5015 is better looking. I guess we're talking about the JLC Navy SEALs diving alarm or the 5015. If you want an alarm, there's only one option there. Alarm watches are the most practical of complications, and dive watches are also tough, hardy, and versatile. They are stylistically appropriate in an office setting where Rolex has effectively set the dress code. Everyone's running around with a GMT, a sub, or a sea dweller, and that's a dress watch. So too can be the Navy SEALs. But I would say if you're comparing it to a 5015, well, that's a beautifully handmade watch. In my opinion, that's a different echelon of high horology than the Navy SEALs. And while I love alarm complications, I would say go with the 5015 and get it in titanium to make it more wearable. A very, very special watch. What else is going on right here? We have Thomas Burnett saying that Chapek Antarctique is an amazing watch. We have Dylan L asking, is Chapek the same Chapek precursor to Patek? Yes. We are talking about... I guess it was František Čepek was his name, and that name was revived in 2013 by a brand that was partially funded by a Kickstarter campaign, bringing back the Čepek name. Čepek and Patek were both emigre from Poland. They were, I believe, officers in a failed military cause, and they moved to Switzerland and they became watchmakers. So from 1839 to, I want to say, 1844, 1845, it was Patek and Chapek, and then Chapek went off on his own. Uh, Patek Philippe never retained those trademarks, and so today Chapek, also based out of Geneva, is a very different company, but it is historically related to Patek and Chapek. And they make nice watches, and they're fun, and they're open about their suppliers, their dials, their cases, their movements. They don't pretend everything's made in-house, and that's absolutely refreshing. Plus, their prices are fair, and their products are good. We got Watch by Design. Hi, everyone. Curtis here from San Diego. Eric Nielsen saying, relative of mine has a black card. He's about $15 million net worth, $4 million liquid. Well, there we go. We peel back the veil. Monkey C Production. Hey, Tim, what's up from Chicago? Hello, my man, and thank you for joining us from the American Midwest. Okay, jumping back into our regularly scheduled program, Saul C. picked up his first and my favorite Rolex, the Milkhouse Z Blue, and he drives his Lexus RCF. It is a high-performance machine. Congratulations, Saul. Wear it in good health. Larry L. of Singapore captures his charming Grand Seiko SBGX 259 at sunset. Tolga of New Jersey, waited patiently at Rolex and was rewarded with his dream watch. Again, wear it in good health and good times. The English watch is in Devon, UK, with a close Pepsi GMT relative and a Frenchie, Twiggy, who you can just see in the background at the beach. Rob F. takes delivery of his new Rolex OP41 Green at the wheel of his Porsche. Wear it in good health and many happy miles behind the wheel. Send your wrist chats to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com, guys, to see your wrist on my list. Jumping into the box, we've got Cull Obsidian staying up late, joining us from London. We've got Connor Prentice from Denton, Texas, the great state of Texas. Mark S. Tim, Brian G. doesn't have a black card. I would be surprised if he didn't. You know what? He never mentioned it, but he did mention once that he regretted not getting the supercharged Range Rover, so he sounds like the kind of guy who might have one. I gotta ask for better Christmas presents from the Gavbergs. What else is going on here? We have Justin D. Hi, Tim. What are the best Omega Seamasters? Any that fly under the radar? The Titanium Ploprof is the best Seamaster made, and I'm talking in terms of tech and spec. It's also one of the most wearable, because it's only 48 millimeters across the wrist. It's 55 down the wrist, but across the wrist, it's actually shorter across the wrist than the Steel Diver 300 meter, which makes the Ploprof shockingly wearable. Also, I would say check out the Cities series if you want something akin to the original 1948 Seamaster. And then the Seamaster Marine Chronometers of the 1970s, some of the best quartz watches ever made, historically important and very, very collectible. I would recommend getting one of those before prices go absolutely nuts. 
And then finally, I would say if you ever have a chance at the ultralight, it's probably the most durable watch Omega has ever made. Anti-magnetic, shock resistant, and water resistant. Technically, it might be the coolest Omega currently in production. And the only Omega that I would recommend as a one for one substitution for a million dollar Richard meal. So those are my recommendations right there. Okay, $20,000 watches that I love. We need to get along here because I'm dragging the show. And I need to talk about the main topic. We've spoken about $3,000 watches, $5,000 watches, $10,000 watches, but you've asked me, Tim, do 20, do 50, do 100,000. Let me know what's possible at the upper end of possibility. And today we do. So with a budget of up to $20,000, anything is possible. Short of a minute repeater, you've got incredible options at 20 grand or less. So let's take a look at our embarrassment of options, starting with the Rolex Skydweller. Reference 326934, white gold bezel here, but otherwise entirely of stainless steel. So steel and white gold, this watch you see here, available as of 2017, and that was the first time Rolex ever had a wait list for a timepiece that had always been viewed as desirable but way too expensive in full gold. This was the model that finally clicked, and it retails for $14,800, which frankly shocked me because that's very reasonable for what you get, and it is the most capable Rolex in the catalog, a GMT with true 1224 splits. It is a Contiem Annuel, an annual calendar, Rolex's first and only, a COSC chronometer, anti-magnetic, 100 meters water resistant, it is all of those things, and a surprisingly wearable 42 millimeters, it reads and wears on the wrist like a very large date just. Now available, I should mention, for this year with a Jubilee bracelet, it always looked like a big date just. Now it can truly wear like a big date just. With steel, you'll pay a $250 premium, but a lot of people are actually ponying up as this is now the single most in demand Sky Dweller model steel, blue dial, Jubilee bracelet. And I've been told by Rolex dealers that this is now a watch that's being allocated so they know how many they're going to get each year. And that is a distinguished status, typically occupied by watches like the GMT, the Daytona, the OP41, the Submariner. So for the Sky Dweller to have joined that echelon of Rolex watch in terms of demand is a very big deal for the Sky Dweller. So I'm told that right now this is the second or third most waitlisted watch, and a lot of Rolex dealers are not even taking new waitlistees. But I will say this, now available on a Jubilee bracelet, you might be able to score the older Oyster bracelet for about $20,000. They're out there. It's going to be hard to find a black dial or blue dial version. For right around 2021, 20, 22, you can still get into a Sky Dweller. And frankly, I think I would actually say this is worth paying the premium or getting on the waitlist. I rarely say pay a premium for a watch or get on a waitlist. I'm usually inclined to vector people towards cool alternatives they might not have thought of, but I like this watch so much and it offers so much capability that I would say that paying six, seven, eight thousand dollars premium over new is not unreasonable and getting on the waitlist for 24 months, 30 months, whatever it is, is actually a good use of your time because you will get a watch that is worth the wait. And Remember, this is a timepiece that is, you know, marked up five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars over its retail price. We're not talking about a thirty-four thousand dollar Nautilus that becomes a four hundred thousand dollar watch, or a twenty-six thousand dollar Chronomet Blue that becomes a one hundred and ten thousand dollar watch. Paying a little bit of a premium for this watch, most of your money is probably safe, as I don't see these ever returning to their retail value on the open market. You'll probably get most of that premium you pay back if you ever decide to sell the watch. Jumping into the box right here, we have Ben L saying, "My AD said he will get only one Blue Dial Sky Dweller this year." We got watch by design, a lucky man, no doubt, saying, "I picked up my two tone Sky Dweller in Hong Kong." In December of 2019 for retail, $17.2,000, no sales tax. Man, you scored. <laughs> a lot, we have a lot of stories like that. I bought my 5711 back in 2014. I bought my Chronomet Blue back in 2016. They're all the kind of stories that make you cry. I remember I could have gotten an AP Star Wheel for about 12,000 bucks once. Now those are 40 to $50,000 watches. The market has caught up with my foresight. But it's not foresight, remember guys, if you don't buy the watch. It's just a fish story. It's the one that got away. And no one really cares how big a fish you never caught. But if you bought that watch at retail, you're the man. Okay, 
Let's talk a little bit about Breguet, a brand we don't discuss often, but I hold them in high regard, and the market generally doesn't. So let's talk about the Breguet Tradition 7027. Can you find a better finished or more magnetically styled dress watch movement below $20,000? I don't think you can. This watch movement has well, actually right there, that's Ulysse Norden, that's my bad. Sean, I apologize. But the Breguet Tradition 7027, uh, it has both elements of great finish, or a great movement, I should say. Aesthetically, a great movement will have finish and architecture. There we go, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, so architecture is the shape of the wheels, the shape of the bridge, the positioning of the different elements. Finish is things like graining of bridges. It's things like guilloche of dial, beveling of edges. It's things like satination of wheels, bluing of screws, and black polishing of regulators. This watch has both. You can see the barrel is at center. The train is laid out with individual finger bridges for the third, the fourth, the, the great, or I should say, the great wheel, the third wheel, the fourth wheel, the escape wheel, and of course, the balance. The balance, which has a parachute shock protection system and it's free sprung, the best of past and present, and the dial, though small, is hand guilloche and made of solid gold galvanized silver. A very specialized watch. 38 millimeters and available in all three golds. It's a bargain in all three. This is a watch that came out in 2005 and to me it was born perfect. There is a larger 7057. I don't think it's necessary. It's 40 millimeters if you want it. I think this is pretty close to perfect. It looks good on any wrist. It's attractive on both sides of the case and the back is even freehand engraved which is very rare. I would say realistically there are no comparable Vacheron Audemars or Protec models available at the price point. And I would even go so far as to say that for that price point, you're not going to get a comparably interesting longer movement. There might be some Saxonia and 1815 models for $15,000, $16,000, but they're not as just thrilling on both sides as the Breguet. This is the kind of watch you will enjoy over and over on both sides with the loop. It's as exciting on the dial as it is on the case back, and I think it's one of the best ways to spend 15 to 20 grand on a used watch. Let's jump into the chat box. Brian McCarthy saying, looks like someone threw a load of watch parts in a glass case. We got Jeffrey D saying, I love Breguet, especially the 5817 Marine Rose Gold. We've got Alex O saying, probably the only time I'd spend that much watch, uh, ah, he's saying, beautiful Breguet, probably the only time I would spend that much money. We have Kiki Fry saying, I can't get on with the sandy colored gold. What about the white gold model? That's a little bit different. And then we have Enrique C saying, I'm not a fan of these small offset dials. So they're not for everyone. BS is not a fan of the yellow gold, but the white gold looks good. And then we have Thomas Burnett saying, absolutely love Breguet. The tradition range is amazing. Edward Ledden saying, Nick Mason bought his Ferrari 250 GTO for 35,000 pounds in 1978. I've heard stories like that. Guys who bought like a GTO in the 70s for $75,000 or, or Mercedes Gullwings generally running on a Chevy small block with the original inline six delivered in a box, like back in the 70s. I've heard stories like that. We have the real two fly asking, would you rather have a Datejust 36 Wimbledon as your one watch, or the Breitling Premier B09 Pistachio plus a Zenith DeFi Classic Skeleton as a two watch collection. I would rather have the Breitling and the Zenith, and I wouldn't have to think twice about it. Really, there are very few Datejusts that could tempt me away from any Zenith, and we're talking maybe the Japanese market Turnograph and precious little else. All right, what else is going on in the box right here? Quarter's Eye saying, Breguet is fantastic, love the brand. i got another option for you guys. JLC Master Ultra Thin Jubilee, a 2013 limited edition in platinum, 880 pieces to celebrate 180 years of Giger Le Coult, a very, very, very special watch. 39 millimeters in platinum, four millimeters thick. This is a watch that is four millimeters razor thin not thick. You don't describe a watch like this as four millimeters thick. You can see it is blade-like. It sinks down below your wrist hair. It's so flat, JLC installed a solid platinum case back to prevent it from bending on your wrist. And it's built by the Specialty Horlogerie shop that 
builds the minute repeaters, the high-end multi-complications, the grand sonnerie, the Ibris Mechanica, the gyro tourbillon. The same people who make those make this. That's how difficult it is to assemble and regulate that watch. Caliber 849 is handmade and hand finished and it's only 1.85 millimeters thick, descended from the 802 Abouche used by Audemars Piguet and Vacheron during the 1950s. This is an all-time great high horology movement. These watches are available between 16,000 and 18,000 used, so why pay 100,000 more than that? to chase the 5711 when you can have something built by a grand sonnery grade watchmaker at Jager Le Coult that's only four millimeters thick. This is proof that some of the coolest watches in the world can be two hand watches with solid case backs. That thing is not just razor thin, it's razor sharp and I mean that sartorially. All right, jumping into viewerist shots number three, Mohammed E of Nairobi, Kenya shares a father and son G-Shock moment in the wild. Check out those zebras. Philip M. is in Iceland with his Rolex Explorer 2 and lounging seals on an ice flow. Severin G. watches watches tonight from Lago Maggiore in Italian Swiss borderland on the Italian side with his Zin Easy M3. Very nice. That's a man after my own heart. Fernando C. of Old Brookville, New York, one of my old riding grounds on the north shore of Long Island. Rides in his Audi R8 with IWC Portuguese Yacht Club Moon and Tide, one of the coolest watches of last year. Derek W. and his Mito 1959 Commander enjoy dusk in Ann Arbor, Michigan, the traditional American heartland. Okay, $20,000 watches that I love continued. Blancpain and the 50 Fathoms Tribute to Milgauss. 500 pieces, 2017, 40.8 millimeters in stainless steel. This is a very special watch. One of the few true peers, historically, to the Rolex Submariner. This came out the same year as the Sub, but a few months prior, making it the first true modern format dive watch. Now, the mil-spec models came out a little bit later, towards the end of the 1950s. This watch is a tribute to that. It has the lovely sapphire-capped bezel. It has a hand-finished caliber 1150 that gives it 100 hours of power reserve. It's still, like the other 50 Fathoms, 300 meters water resistant. It is an easy watch to wear on the wrist. So if the 5015 at 45 millimeters is too big and the reference 5000 bathyscaphe at 43 millimeters is too big, this is really a Rolex comparable because it's 40.3. The Rolex sub is now 41. They're very, very similar. But this is more natural on a strap. And remember, we know the names of the people who were involved in the creation of the 50 Fathoms, Jean-Jacques Victor, Bob Malubier, Claude Rifo, people whose names are immortalized in the annals of this watch. Whereas with Rolex, we have no idea where the sub came from other than some sort of corporate design board. This thing has more soul. And I would say it's an, it's an awesome watch. The market is somewhat above the roughly $14,000 retail price from when this was new. You're going to pay between $17,500 and $20,000. But still, you can still get it on the bracelet for that price, which means it fits into our class of 20 grand watches. Even if the market is admittedly small, there were only three on Chrono24 when I checked. An awesome piece, and I should say in our limit and far less than a green sub which, as you can see, has broken well through the $20,000 barrier. And I think the Blanc Pat is a more beautiful and more interesting watch. Audemars Piguet, millinery. Audemars Piggy, back with the millinery 4101. When this thing came out in 2011, it was an absolute bomb blast. It was supposed to be the moment when Audemars Piguet dress watches in general and the millinery collection in particular finally hit their stride and came of age in the modern era and equal pillar alongside the Royal Oaks. Look at that thing. It's spectacular. It's 90% of the fascination of a display case back in a tourbillon. And with an original retail price of $24,900, the price was right. It fills up the wrist, but it's not oversized. It's got great presence, but it's not gaudy. It is a handsome watch, but it's not a Royal Oak. And it's an enduring design, but it's not by Gerald Genta. It still looks as good 10 years later. What happened? Well, in 2012, Audemars Piguet, under a new CEO, decided that it had basically expended too much brand equity and tarnished its name with an excess of frivolous Royal Oak Offshore limited editions in the 2000s. So 2012 was all about paring down the models and emphasizing the traditional Royal Oak and everything. The offshore, the millinery, the pocket watches, the grand complications, they all suffered as the Royal Oak came to the fore and basically crowded out all other AP watches until 2019 
and the Code 1159. This should have been the coming of age for modern day AP dress watches. Instead, it's just a great buy on secondary markets as this is a watch with a sensational open dial that gives you all the action of a display case back with the movement on the front and that lovely rose gold gilded bridge with Gyromax balance. It is a watch that is still an awesome watch, and I should say, like all millineries, this awesome watch wears well on a small wrist, and there's my wrist for proof. Last retail was 24 grand and 500 clams attached, but sub $20,000 options can still be found, so this watch fits squarely into our price point. And again, you're getting an Audemars Piguet. Finally, if you want complication and you want a brand that marches to its own drummer, Ulysse Nardin and the Sonata. Now, the first Sonata came out in 2003 and it immediately established a reputation as the minute repeater of alarm watches. It's much more than just an alarm watch, but the moniker fits minute repeater. Not because it repeats the minutes, but because you'll want to repeat the alarm minute after minute after minute. It is sonorous, paced, beautiful. It has a singing, lyrical sustain. It's gorgeous. And there's a reason. This epic movement, and we'll go back to the movement now, that is the correct movement this time, it gives you everything. Over 100 joules, in-house engineering, a bi-directional, quick settable, double-digit date, silicon hairsprings, and later on, full silicon escapements. True 12 and 24 hour dual time displays, so it's also a true GMT with a travel time toggle so you can move the local hour hand one hour forward or backwards and step it without disrupting the other time displays. It has an alarm that can be set for all 24 hours of the day, or if you prefer, you can set it in a countdown format, something that's almost unheard of on non-digital watches. And I should mention it has an alarm that can be turned off when not desired and the energy conserved. That's not universal among alarm watches. It has cathedral gongs. It has a minute repeater centrifugal governor. It has black polished strikers on its display case back. Everything about this watch exhausts superlatives. And the shocker here is that you can own one in precious metal, no less, for less than the price of a used 2021 Submariner. That's right, 18 to 20 grand. You can load up a Sonata Cathedral with cathedral gongs, minute repeater tone, GMT, a fully loomed dial, the bi-directional quick set, a full silicon escapement, anti-magnetic hairspring, and a free-sprung balance. Beautifully made inside and out, and unlike anything available from a mass market brand. This is one of the greats of the modern era. Guys, it's ready and waiting for less than you will pay for a used Kermit. Okay, viewer wrist shots number four. I asked, you answered. We're starting out with Chris. Chris is ready for anything with the Alanga Unzona Grand Longa 1 Luminous. Looking good. A lot of folks don't know that version of the Grand Longa with Loom exists. Peter A. and his friend share the Rolex Submariner 2-Tone. Looking good. Looking blue. Time Hill. Impresses with a high-grade American Illinois Sangamo Special 60-hour 23-jewel pocket watch. That one is truly a prince as a pocket watch fan. Conrad combines his Acura NSX supercar with the Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter in matching blue. I am jealous of the man who's about to take that ride. Spencer C. drives us home with his Fiat 500. And Cartier Pasha, big date. Fiat 500, Forza. Forza Pasha, Forza, Gerald Genta, the true designer of the modern Cartier Pasha watch. Guys, send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on my pixels. Thank you so much to Sean for bearing with me, and thanks to all of you for making the best job in the world possible. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on.